Great. Uh, so hello, uh, I'm Thea from the Center for Climate Research Singapore, and I'm really pleased to be here today to talk about some seasonal prediction in Southeast Asia using a case study that started in July 2020 and went a little bit into August as well. Uh, this case is not surprisingly associated with extremes, uh, but in particular ones that led to disasters in Southeast Asia. Uh, but before I get started, I would like to also thank my colleagues, Wailing and Ryan, also from the Center for Climate Research Singapore, who contributed to this presentation. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware that S2S, or subseasonal to seasonal prediction, sits between the weather forecast and seasonal time scale. Uh, the precise definition varies depending on the region in use, but here in Singapore, we usually consider forecasts out longer than a week. Weather forecast scale drops dramatically in the region, even after a few hours. And now looking globally at the scale on the right-hand side, we can see that the highest scale for precipitation at lead times of three to four weeks tends to be in the tropics, which includes Southeast Asia. Uh, so now let me introduce you to Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia experiences two main monsoon seasons, and these are captured in this figure here. Those regions with green and blue colors experience on average more rainfall in June to August, and which loosely represents the Southwest monsoon season, while those in the orange and red colors experience more rainfall during December to February, which is approximately the Northeast monsoon season. We also have two geographical areas, mainland Southeast Asia and the maritime continent. Those countries inside the purple box are mainland Southeast Asia, while those outside are part, we consider part of the maritime continent. Uh, Southeast Asia is also prone to many hydrometeorological disasters. Looking at this figure from a 2019 UNESCAP report on disasters in the Asia Pacific region, you can see there's a lot of information here about various hazards. But I would like to draw your attention to the black boxes, which are areas with a high concentration of economic stock exposed to hydrometeorological hazards. And this includes mainland Southeast Asia, as well as parts of the maritime continent. With a high exposure to hydrometeorological disasters, S2S in Southeast Asia can fill a critical information gap in disaster preparedness, helping to shift from a reactive response to a proactive response. Uh, we'll be looking at two case study areas, uh, and one of them is in northern Thailand, so that's approximately the purple star, and the other one is northern Sulawesi, Indonesia, the light purple star. And as I said, they take place in July and the beginning of August, so this is the southwest monsoon season, the wettest time of year for mainland Southeast Asia. You may be asking why the Center for Climate Research Singapore is looking at such a wide area. Well, we actually contribute to the Asian Specialized Meteorological Center, where ASEAN stands for the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Uh, the main aims of ASMC include to undertake research and development to improve scientific understanding and prediction of weather and climate systems that are significant to Southeast Asia, as well as conduct regional capability development programs for ASEAN National Meteorological Services. As part of this, we've been contributing to the S2S Southeast Asia pilot project, which aims to explore the usefulness of S2S product products for disaster risk reduction in Southeast Asia in real time, with an additional goal to implement operational subseasonal outlooks for disaster management after this project. And here we've been working with a regional user, the AHA Center. The full name's on the screen here, but it's a bit of a mouthful to remember, so it's easier just to call it the AHA Center. Uh, the AHA Center is a regional intergovernmental organization for disaster management. And we've been providing them with some seasonal outlooks since February 2020 for up to three weeks ahead. And the case study I'm sharing with you today is from this work. Uh, so let's get on to the case study. Uh, first, let's look what happened in northern and northeast Thailand. So flooding and landslides and mudslides overall affected more than 100,000 people during this time and damaged 22,000 houses. You can see here people crossing a swollen river, which was after the heaviest rainfall. The rainfall was linked to what was previously tropical storm Sinalakau, which reached the region towards the end of the case study week. Um, the figure at the bottom left here shows the rainfall during the week 22nd to 2nd of August as a percentile. So this is the Monday to Sunday week with the heaviest rainfall. Uh, the actual storm actually made landfall in Vietnam, I think, around the 1st of August and actually continued raining after and raining after to the 3rd of August as well. But this is the main week uh, with the heaviest rainfall. And in this figure here, the values that are hatched are where it exceeded the 90th percentile. 
Shifting to the other focus area, we have for the same week, the 27th, 27th of July to the 2nd of August, a flooding reported in northern Sulawesi. Uh, the floods affected more than 22,000 people and damaged 93 homes and five bridges. The event required people to be evacuated and relief distributed, which included flood aid. And this image shows workers from PMI preparing to distribute some of this food. Looking at the rainfall for this region, it also exceeded the 90th percentile for this week. Uh, so we have quickly looked at the impacts of two flood-related events that were associated with extreme rainfall. Uh, but let's remind ourselves about what was happening climate-wise in July 2020. We had what was to eventually become a La Nina event developing in the Pacific. We can see a weak uh, pattern here in the sea surface temperature anomalies in this bottom figure. Uh, the red box is just the Nina 3.4 index, and then the black box is for the DMI for the Indian Ocean Dipole, which by this time was neutral in August as well. Uh, but looking around the region, we also see warm anomalies in the Bay of Bengal, as well as in the South China Sea. Looking at the shorter term, the RMM index shows an MDR signal towards the end of July in phase two, moving eastwards and reaching phase four at the start of August. Uh, phases three and four bring wetter conditions to eastern Indonesia at this time of year, as well as parts of the region around 20, 10 degrees north, which includes southern Thailand and parts of Cambodia and Vietnam. So these factors bode particularly well for at least above average rainfall uh, for the, this period, at least for in the eastern Indonesia. So uh, we finally arrived at the main question, how did the seasonal outlook do for this week? And well, from the SOS database, we'll just be using the ECMWF model here. Uh, but first, let's have a look at the Hindcast skill. Uh, here we're showing the rock score for ECMWF and for discriminating between rainfall above the 19th percentile and below the 19th percentile. The three different weeks are the three different lead times, uh, with the days below the week indicating the days after initialization that are considered that week. So week one is day five to 11 of the forecast. When you see orange and red, this is good skill, while yellow is moderate skill, purple is some skill, and blue, little to no skill. And gray means the rock score is less than 0.5 or worse than random. Now, focusing on the two study areas, you can see a bit of difference between the two. Starting from week one, the skill is relatively good for Sulawesi, but only moderate for northern Thailand. As we go forward in lead times, for Sulawesi, the skill only drops slightly. It's, it's above 0 0.7 even at week three. However, by week three for Northern Thailand, there's little to no skill. So let's have a look at the outlook. So uh, the top figure is the probability of exceeding the 90th percentile for that week based on the initial conditions from the 9th of July. Uh, and this is for the week of the 27th of July to 2nd of August. So we can see that the model is predicting more than three times uh, in the climatological probability of exceeding the 90th percentile for Sulawesi, but there's no increase for Northern Thailand. Uh, based on this product and other products, plus the climate drivers, including MGO, we gave the following outlook to the AHA Center on the 13th of July. For week three, there is a small increase in chance of very heavy rainfall in Eastern Indonesia. And here we specifically mentioned Northern Sulawesi as well. Uh, so that would make a hit uh, for giving some sort of warning for Sulawesi, but a missing for Thailand. Uh, so we saw for the 90th percentile, the forecast was not indi indicating an increased chance of very heavy rainfall. But what if we use a lower threshold? So here I'm showing in the top row the forecast, and in the bottom row the associated rock score based on the hindcasts. And this is for, in the different columns are different thresholds. So the 90th is on the left, and we've already seen that. Uh, but in the middle, we have the upper quintile, or chance of exceeding the 80th percentile. And then on the right is the above, above normal thresile, the upper third of the distribution. While there wasn't an increase in the 90th percentile for Northern Thailand, we can see it for the 80th percentile, the chance was of exceeding this was about 30 to 40 percent, so about double the climatological likelihood. And there's also an increase in the tersal. So for northeastern Thailand, between 50 to 60 percent chance of it being above normal. And the scale assessment from the Hindcast data is also higher, particularly when we look at the tersal forecasts, where blue to purple, some scale for the tersal forecast is compared to blue to gray, which is little to no scale. So back to the forecast we gave. Um, we also gave a second forecast a week beforehand. Uh, so quickly looking at the outlook from the 27th of July, but this is the initial conditions here are from the 23rd of July. 
Uh, we see now that the model is much more confident, uh, more than seven times more likely than climatology over Sulawesi. Uh, there are some signs of something over parts of northern Thailand. Uh, however, at the time we were writing the outlook, due to this relatively small air area and the poor spill, we did not include this in this week's outlook. Know that the guidance that we received from Pagasa, I think there's some colleagues from Pagasa here as well, on potential TC development from the 21st of July didn't indicate anything for TC development either. We did actually indicate a small increase in chance in northern and northeast Thailand in the following week. So that's the 3rd to 9th of August, so only time two weeks, uh, which could indicate that the model was actually capturing, capturing something, only it was slightly delayed. And if you remember that for the TC, it actually was making landfall towards the end of our study period, and the heavy rainfall actually did continue on into the, that week of the 3rd to 9th of August as well. Uh, so in summary, uh, hopefully I have convinced you that seasonal predictions can be useful for some extreme heavy rainfall events for more than two weeks ahead of time. And in this case, we're looking at extreme rainfall events that led to disasters. In the case study shown, the 90th percentile worked well for the Indonesian case study. However, it did not work so well for Thailand, although it was predicting wetter conditions, and this was the wetter time of year for them. Uh, these results are actually fairly standard when we compare our outlooks with the disasters that have occurred in Southeast Asia, with generally better prediction for the maritime continent and not much skill for mainland Southeast Asia. Uh, so there are some points to note from this. Uh, as I just mentioned, the model skill does vary depending on the region and also time of year, although we didn't get into this today. Uh, it also depends on what's associated with the rainfall. Tropical cyclones can be more difficult to predict at the subseasonal time scale, as we've heard from other very good presentations. Uh, and when there is a driver present that is more predictable, such as MJO, this can help, uh, sort of like doors of adversity and windows of opportunity. And we should take advantage of windows of opportunity to predict extreme events. Uh, there are demand from users to use SOS predictions for disaster management and disaster preparedness, because there's actions that they can take at this time scale that are either less effective uh, at the weather or seasonal time scale or, or can't be done at all. Uh, but it's also important to remember that limitations on using these SOS predictions don't just come from limitations in model skill. There's also challenges in reporting disasters, so it's important for studies like this that are linking outlooks or predictions with disasters. As well as there are questions on how the different agencies can interact effectively and make best use of the seasonal outlooks. Uh, so that's the end, and I'm happy to answer any questions.